Hi, I'm Brad Neal with the University of Indianapolis, and today's video is going to be over the composition of substances and solutions. But specifically, we're going to be focusing in on section 3.1 of the OpenStax Chemistry 2E textbook, and the link to the uh, reading you can see up there. So make sure that you do that reading before you watch this video, otherwise uh, the contents of the video might not make as much sense. So let's go ahead and let's get started. So when we're talking about at the beginning of this chapter, or what we're talking about at the beginning of this chapter is really formula mass. Um, and formula mass is gonna come in kind of two flavors, and it's gonna depend on whether we have an ionic compound or a covalent compound. At the end of the day, what we're trying to say is, here is the one finite unit of our substance, and this is what we are going to say its mass is. The nice thing is, we're going to be using the periodic table, which we'll almost always have with us as chemists, to determine this kind of information. Now, for some nomenclature, some naming related things, for covalent compounds, we typically refer to the formula mass as really the molecular mass. And that's because with covalent compounds, um, like you see in your reading, they do exist in one discrete unit. So you will have a certain number of atoms in a very specific arrangement, and that will be your molecule. The next molecule will have that same number of atoms in that same kind of arrangement, and that will be its own individual molecule. The difference though for ionic compounds is that you see something kind of like we have uh, right here. So here we've got the crystal structure of sodium chloride you don't ever have just a single sodium ion interacting with a single chloride ion. You have this repeating 3D structure, especially when it's in crystal form. Um, because it just repeats and repeats and repeats, what we do is we say, okay, what's the smallest ratio of the one ion to the other ion? That becomes our formula unit. So in the case of sodium chloride, it's the sodium and the chloride. It's a one-to-one -one ratio. That, then, we would say, is the basis that we're going to need to calculate out our formula mass. So, like I said here, one formula unit, that's the difference when it comes to an ionic compound. Because with ionic compounds, you have this repeated, uh, usually long-range order interactions, especially if they're in a crystal form. So let's do a couple cal example calculations here. Um, and so we have uh, two compounds that I would hope, based off of the material from chapter two, you would be able to name at this point. So go ahead and pause the video here and write down what you think the names are for these species. And when you're done, come back to the video. Okay, I'm hoping that you hit pause. Um, so the very first one that we've got is a species that's going to be carbon tetrachloride. So for that, we're going to, uh, and to help us, we're going to switch over to um, a different view on the screen here. So we've got for that first one, that carbon tetrachloride. So carbon, and we know that it needs the tetra because this is a substance that's made up of chloramistanil. Well, fine. Chloride. There we go. Chloride. This is a substance that's made up of two nonmetals. And for our other substance, what we're going to do is uh, use our naming rules for uh, the Fe203. We're going to use that shortcut, and we're going to say that that uh, three on the oxygen. So just to write this out, Fe2O3, that three on the oxygen is the charge of the iron. The two is the charge on the oxygen, which we remember from the oxygen being there in group six. So this is going to be iron oxide. The point of this wasn't to do naming. The point of this was to start calculating out the formula units or the uh, molecular uh, mass. So the formula mass or the molecular mass. So to help us figure that out, what we are going to actually need is a periodic table. So we go to our periodic table, and what we're going to be able to do is look up 
where the substances are. And so we could see where our carbon is and it's gonna be that 12.01. Now specifically when we want to use the number that we see here on the periodic table because that's its atomic mass. For the chlorine, we're gonna have that 35.45. So when we now go over here to do our actual problem, actual problem, not the change the slides. There we go. When we come over here to do our actual problem, now we're going to say for that carbon tetrachloride, we have four carbon, or I'm sorry, we have one carbon and from the periodic table, it's 12.01. It's units because this is a measurement and we'll have a number and it's gonna have a unit. The unit's gonna be atomic mass units. We have four of our chlorides and we said from the chlorides that's 35.45 AMU. So that's gonna be 12.01 because that's math plus, and then we're gonna need our calculator and we'll type that in here real fast. We're gonna have our four times the 35.45 and double check my work, but the number I got was 141.8 AMU. And so then when we go to actually say, since this was carbon, this was chloride, carbon tetrachloride will have an, a molecular mass of 12.01 plus the 141.8. So 12.01, type that in my calculator, add that with the 141, and we end up with 153.81 AMU. Now, many of you are going to be asking very rightfully, what do we do about significant figures? If the question is only asking you to calculate the molecular uh, mass or the formula mass, you're going to want to follow your significant figure rules here. So the significant figure rules for addition are we go to the number that had the least number of decimals in it. We drop our line and because I didn't, line these up well, that's where our line would go. So we would really end up with 153.8 AMU as the final answer. Most of the time, as soon as we get out of this section and we get past this chapter, this is gonna be a uh, unit conversion that we're going to be using in other parts of the problem. So nine times out of 10, I'm not gonna be concerned if you do that um, proper um, significant figures at this point because this will not be your final answer nine times out of 10. Let's go ahead and let's do our, our iron oxide question. We said that that was the F2O3. So we go over and we'll go ahead and rewrite it just to make things nicer, F2O3. We go to our periodic table. Well, let's write out the problem first. We have two irons two of them and from our periodic table we have 55 55.85 and the units atomic mass units and for our oxygen we're gonna have three of them and we're gonna have 16. now depending on your periodic table you might have 15.9994 or something like that when it comes to working the problems, I just want you to use all the digits that your periodic table gives you. Um, like I said, most of the time, your final answer for one of these kinds of problems is not going to be what the formula unit is or the formula mass is. It's going to be using that formula mass in some other capacity, and that's where you're going to usually uh, be basing your sig figs off of. So... We can go here and we could do the same thing and we could type our information into our calculator. So our two times our 55.85 and then plus 
and then I'm going to use parentheses on my calculator, the 3 times the 16, and I'm ending up with, and you should check this on your for yourselves, but I got 159.7 AMU. And it's that easy and it's that hard. So the things that you have to do to, to be successful here are you have to remember uh, to actually be able to write out the formula correctly um, because if you can't write out the formula correctly, you're not going to know how many atoms of the thing there are. So, for example, how do I make the question above harder? All I had to write out was iron 3 oxide. If I didn't give you the formula, you and if you didn't know how to turn the name into the formula, you would end up with the wrong formula mass. So that naming really is super critical and very, very important for success. Um, after that, you have to remember to go to your periodic table and make sure that you write down your units. So it's overall not super horrible. But as you might expect, especially from this class, we're not done. We're going to use this material to now talk about something called molar mass. So the definition of molar mass is going to be the mass in grams of one mole of a substance um, and it's going to have the unit of grams per mole. Now, if you're like, that's awesome, we haven't talked about moles yet, we're getting ready to talk about moles. But the thing that I want to drive home right now to you is your molar mass is going to equal numerically whatever your atomic, molecular, or formula mass is of your substance. So, for example, if we go back to the iron to iron three oxide that we just worked out. Its formula mass is gonna be equal to this 159.7 atomic mass units. Its molar mass, if we do that, the molar mass is going to be equal to 159.7 grams per mole. So if you can find the formula mass, if you can find the molecular mass, you can find the molar mass. The key difference here, though, is the units. Also, the key difference is the magnitude in which these numbers actually represent things. So a mole, which we're going to talk about here in a minute, represents a, like a scale that is really, really different from the scale that an atomic mass unit is. Um, but the punchline of everything is if you can find one, you can find the other. All right. So now that we've got molar mass, like what that is, we should really define what a mole is so we can maybe understand some of the ins and outs of molar mass a little better. So if you think about it, an atom is ridiculously small. Um, it's so small that just about anything that you deal with in your regular existence, anything at a macro scale that you can see with your own eye contains a number of atoms inside of it that are just, it's boggling to the mind. The mind has a ridiculous time trying to comprehend how big of a number it really is. Like how many number of atoms are truly even in like this little can of pop here. Um, I'm sorry, sparkling water, fizzy water, whatever the thing is. To help us with this understanding and be able to talk about things with one another without writing out ridiculously huge numbers, we're going to introduce the concept of a mole. Now, we decided, we it was decided, that the proper abbreviation for a mole is to just drop the E. Because when you abbreviate things, you want to make sure that they're easier to write. And by writing one less letter in a four-letter word, we've saved ourselves a lot of time. I don't know why that's abbreviation, but that's it. Make sure you do not write lowercase m by itself. Lowercase m is molality. It means something very different. So M-O-L if you're going to do the abbreviation. M-O-L-E if you feel like you've got the energy to go ahead and just put that E in there. 
the idea behind a mole is the exact same idea as the term dozen. If I just say a dozen to you, you say the number 12. That's right. You doesn't matter what I say, a dozen donuts. You then say 12 donuts, a dozen geese. It's 12 geese. A mole is the exact same way. We can have a mole of donuts. We can have a mole of geese. Both of those would be a frightening number of donuts and geese respectively, but we can do it. It's just a term that denotes a specific number to us, the reader. The number is going to be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd of that thing. So if we said we had a dozen donuts, we would have 12 donuts. If we had a mole of donuts, we would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd donuts. That's a lot of donuts. I'm pretty sure even if we evenly distributed that out amongst everybody on the planet Earth, no one would be able to survive eating that amount of donut ever. It's a really huge number, but that should make sense because atoms are really, really small. So it takes a huge number of atoms to be in the same place at the same time in order for us to observe them in a macroscopic way. Now, thanks to some craftiness in our definitions um, and some forethought about doing some definitions, we have defined um, substances such that a sample of a natural element with a mass that is equal to the element's atomic mass, if that atomic, ma- like if the mass of the original sample was measured in grams, is going to be equal to one mole of atoms. It's a little bit confusing, but what it boils then down to is one mole is going to mean 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Um, we're going to skip this one for a second. I won't, we got our slides out of order. Here's how that definition of a mole comes into play. So if we take a look at one of our elements, such as carbon here, our average atomic mass of carbon, the AMUs, from the periodic table is going to be 12.01. We, discri- we discussed that the molar mass of a substance is going to be the same numerically as the average atomic mass. So this, so this 12.01. If we have 12.01 grams of carbon, we will, by definition, have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. We can do the same thing with hydrogen. Now, hydrogen on the periodic table is 1.008. So if that means that's Molar mass is 1.008. If we have 1.008 grams of hydrogen, by definition, then we would have 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of hydrogen. So we have the same number of atoms of hydrogen as we do carbon, even though we have different amounts of the things, like we have different masses of the things. But that's okay because we've talked about in class how hydrogen and carbon have a very different neutron and proton count. So our carbon has a very, (laughs) very much bigger number of neutrons um, and protons compared to hydrogen and electrons for that matter. But electrons are really small. So we don't like adding or gaining an electron really doesn't change the average atomic mass of a substance. It's the protons and neutrons that really do that the like the number of protons and neutrons is really different and that's why that molar mass changes but if you just count them up one to one 
the atomic the number of atoms you have and the number of, of carbon and the atoms you have of hydrogen would be the exact same even though the mass is different and so you can do that entire process then that we just talked about along the entire table that's up here. So for your carbon, your hydrogen, your oxygen, any element on the periodic table, you can find out what its average atomic mass is on the periodic table. That's gonna be equal to its molar mass. And if you have that many, if you have the same number of grams as you have the molar mass of that substance, you will know that you have that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms or another way of saying that because you see that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms you could say I have one mole of carbon one mole of hydrogen one mole of oxygen one mole of sodium one mole of chlorine because a mole is a simplified version of this number that's above us because it gets kind of wonky to do a ton of math where you're always using times 10 to the 23rd. It just, it's easier if you've got a nice little factor like the mole. And that's why this slide is really here. So it turns out that, like if you think about donuts as an example, and you go to a donut shop um, and you're ordering a bunch of donuts for you and your friends, you don't really care how much the box weighs when you leave the donut shop. You just want to make sure that you've got an eclair for that weird person in your life. You want to make sure that you've got a Boston cream for yourself because you love and respect yourself and you recognize Boston cream is by far the superior donut. You've got a sparkle donut for that kid, that friend of yours who's still child at heart, a uh, sprinkle donut. You've got the pumpkin donut because pumpkins. You've got the chocolates because chocolate is delicious and never is wrong. You've got the plain ones for that person who really just enjoys a nice plain yeast donut. You don't care how much it, the box weighs. What you do care is that because you've got six friends, you have six donuts. They're, the masses of each of those donuts will be different, but it will still be enough donuts for everyone. Atoms and molecules are just like donuts. Their masses will be different from one another. The mass of an iron atom is very different from a nickel atom, from, very different from a boron atom. The mass is different, but one atom, uh, you can have one individual atom of each of them. They'll just have a different mass. Just like the masses of your donuts will be different for the different individual types of donuts that you have. This concept's gonna be really important, uh, especially when we start doing chemical reactions later on. Okay, and if you forgot, Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. So now let's do some practice problems where we convert uh, mass and to the amount of things that we have. Because a mole is really not a count of the mass. Grams measure mass. Moles measure how many of the thing we have. So a mass is how a mass, the grams, um, versus the mole, which is a count of how many individual things you've got. So first one up is you've got 4.5 moles of gold. How many grams of gold do you have? So we're going to need to use our periodic tables for this. Um, to help us out here, I'm gonna write down the first part of this question though. All right. So we've got 4.5 mole of gold. I suggest that you guys get in the habit of writing out the unit as well as the element that you're working with. This will be helpful in about one chapter from now. Um, so just go ahead and start practicing that. So we're trying to get from moles to grams. Remember the stuff we did in chapter one where we were talking about dimensional analysis? 
yup, it's dimensional analysis time again. So we need some kind of conversion factor to go between moles and grams. And that's gonna be our molar mass. So sometimes uh, you'll see people write it out with two capital M's for molar mass. Molar mass is going to have the units of grams per mole. We can go to our periodic table and we can see when we get there. Okay. So we go to our periodic table and we can find gold on it and gold's going to be right here and it's going to be 197. And I know it's really hard to read, but I'm assuming you have a periodic table sitting next to you because you're doing chemistry. So the 197, we said, would be the atomic mass and the atomic mass would equal the molar mass. So 197 grams per mole. We can write this out in one of two ways, just like every conversion factor. 197 grams of gold for every one mole of gold, or we can write it out as one mole of gold over 197 grams of gold. Either way works, just make sure that 197 sticks with the grams because that's the number and the measurement, or the measurement and the unit as part of that measurement. Okay, so let's go back to the problem. The problem says we're trying to go from this number of moles to grams. So we will go ahead and let's Scroll down here a little bit to give ourselves a little bit of space. Rewrite that 4.5 moles of AU. And then we're going to pick the proper unit conversion factor here um, that will allow us to get two grams. So take a second here and ask yourself, is it going to be this one or is it going to be this one? If you pick the first one, you are right. And the reason that you are right is because if we then write this out in dimensional analysis style, the 197 grams of gold on the top, the one mole of gold on the bottom, what we find out is, especially if we do that little trick where we just write the 4.5 and we put it over one because it's already in the numerator. We can just make it explicitly in the numerator. If we do that, moles of AU cancel. So we're going to be left now with units of grams of gold. So we can take that 4.5 when we turn the calculator on, 4.5 times the 197, and we end up with a nice number of 886.5. And our units, the only ones that are left, are grams of gold. This, though, would be a time where you're going to want to use your significant figures. So you had two sig figs from your original problem, the 4.5. So that means we're going to have two significant figures in our final answer. The 6 is going to tell that 8 to go up. So 809. 890 grams of gold. A better way of writing that out, 8.9 times 10 to the second grams of gold. Not too shabby. When you are good at these, these won't take you any more time than it is to just write out that very first line. So you're looking at this, this kind of problem shouldn't take you any more than 30 seconds. So going back to our questions now, oops, okay. What if we had 4.5 moles of gold and we were trying to get to how many atoms of gold that is? Okay, so we're going to give ourselves some space. Oops, wrong way. And we're gonna have our 4.5 moles of gold. This is where Avogadro's number is going to come into play. 
and that definition we gave ourselves of one mole is going to be equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. Particles is going to be an important word here. We're going to use particles to represent uh, various species, such as atoms, because an atom can be a particle. A molecule can be a discrete particle, its own individual particle. So, so we could say a molecule instead of particles. So let's just go ahead and get the list going here. Atoms, so e.g., examples being atoms, molecules. I suppose you could go ahead and do um, something for ions here as well. Um, so if you wanted to know how many uh, individual atoms for a particular ionic compound, um, you could put in a unit or a term here too. The, you can really put in any term that is appropriate as long as it's its own individual finite discrete particle. So how does this help us? So if we go here to the 4.5, I'm sorry, let's go back and let's write out our possible unit conversions. The 1.5 to this, since we're dealing with gold, gold is its own individual atom. So we're going to use the one mole is equal to 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. So that means we could write it out one mole, in this case of gold, over... 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold. And we're going to need to draw that out just a little further. Or we can write the 6.022 uh, times 10 to the 23rd atoms of gold over the one mole of gold. Again, we're just using that definition that we gave ourselves of, mat of moles. So we jack around with the computer and the scrolling here, and we say 4.5 moles of AU. We scroll up just a little bit here, and we decide which unit it makes sense. We're trying to get to atoms. So we're going to use conversion one, or we're going to use conversion two. Hopefully you picked conversion two. So you're going to then, if, I'm, if I were you, I would do the trick where I'd say 4.5 as my numerator and the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms for every one mole of AU. And I forgot the AU out here. So I want to go back and I want to fix that. And now by writing it out this way, my moles of gold will cancel. And I'm going to be left with now a situation where I'm just going to need to type this into my calculator and see what we get. So let's scroll back down so that we can kind of see what's going on. And I can write that out. So we've got our 4.5. This is where you're gonna also wanna make sure that you know how to use your calculator properly. Um, the times 10 to the 23rd works a little differently in each of your calculators, and that's why we're trying to practice those kinds of problems earlier in the semester. So 6.022, and I don't honestly remember how my own calculator works right now because I go back and forth between Casio and a Texas Instrument calculator. And I remembered how to do it, so I got it. And my final answer is 2.7099 times 10 to the 24th. We're going to run into the same thing that we talked about previously with respect to significant figures. We still only have two, so our final answer should be 2.7 times 10 to the 24th. And now our units are going to be atoms specifically atoms of gold. And that is the forward and backward if we're starting at moles. However, we can ask ourselves questions 
that incorporate both steps simultaneously. So, for example, how many atoms are in three grams of carbon? Okay, so give ourselves some space here. We're starting with three, and then just to make things a little bit easier for ourselves, let's go ahead and assume that the problem really said 3.0, even though it's not written that way, I should have written it that way. 3.0 grams of carbon. You can go to your periodic table, look up what your molar mass of carbon is, and you're gonna see it is 12.01 grams per mole. Just like with the gold example, we can write the molar mass of our carbon uh, two different ways. It makes most sense to have the grams of carbon there in the bottom. So the 12.01 grams of carbon for every one mole of carbon. And a lot of you right now are thinking, okay, we're gonna stop and we're gonna enter that into our calculators and then we'll do the next thing. Because look, grams of carbon cancel and now I'm left with moles of carbon. We're left with moles of carbon, so we can go ahead and continue on with this problem using our one mole, meaning the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd particles. And in this case, our particle is going to be an atom. We know it's an atom because carbon is just an atom by itself. So we're going to, like we did in the gold problem, have to think, how do we write this equivalency so that the moles cancel out? So that means putting mole of carbon at the bottom, the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon on top. And now our moles of carbon cancel and we're left with atoms of carbon. And that's what the problem wanted in the first place. So now we can go ahead and we can multiply everything that's in our numerator. So we can take the three and then we can multiply that by a one, which is excitingly three, but I just went ahead and multiplied by one anyways, times the 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd and then divide by everything that's in the numerator. So I could say, if I'm gonna be a completionist, divide by one, then divide by 12.01, then divide by one. And the final answer I come up with then will be my final answer for my problem. So you want to multiply all of your numerator out, then divide all of your denominator out and try to do that all in your calculator before you hit enter. So 3.0 times 1 times 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd divided by 1 divided by 12.01 divided by 1. Trust me, you'll run into fewer problems that way, uh, especially with respect to rounding. So if you do that, you should end up with something that's like uh, 1.50 and a whole lot of numbers after that. I'm going to cheat just a little bit because I know I've got two sig figs right there. The next number after the five was gonna be a zero, so it's not gonna be significant. So 1.5 times 10 to the 23rd. But that's just a number, this is a measurement, so we need to include our units. Our units here will be atoms of carbon. Now, there is a way that we can actually rationalize this answer that we just got to see if it actually makes any kind of sense. The way we do that is apply the definitions that we've just talked about. For example, we have three grams of carbon. We know that from the periodic table, it takes 12 grams of carbon, excuse me, 12.01 specifically, to have one mole of carbon. So the three grams that we're working with is less than that, which means we have less than one mole of carbon. So our final answer should be less than one mole of carbon. One mole of carbon would be 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. The final answer we came up with is 1.5 times 10 to the 23rd. That's smaller than one mole numerically. So even if that number doesn't make any real world sense to us because it's a ridiculously large number, that's okay. 
we still know it's within the realm of possibility and being a correct answer just based off of some definitions that we know. So let's finish up here with um, one more example. Um, and this one's gonna be a little bit more complicated. How many moles of potassium ion are present in 2.4 grams of potassium sulfide? Now, remember when I was saying earlier that if you can't write out the chemical formula, you won't be able to do these problems? This is an example of if you can't write out the chemical formula, you won't be able to do these problems. Because most of the time when you see problems from me, you're going to see me write out the chemical name and not the chemical formula. So let's go ahead and let's start thinking this through. The first thing we have to do is convert the potassium sulfide into a chemical formula. So go ahead and hit pause on the video uh, and write out that chemical formula. Go ahead, it's okay. I, will, I got plenty of time, you can do it. Okay, I'm assuming you did it. Potassium is going to have a plus one charge because it's there in group one. Sulfide is going to have a negative two charge because it's in group two. So you need two positives to cancel out the, the two negatives. And since you can't change the charge on the potassium sides to be anything other than plus one, we're just going to have two of them. So this means for every one of these things right here, we're going to have two potassiums for every, for every one sulfide. Okay, and specifically, if we're gonna be smart about this, we should put in our charges there. Okay, so turns out that this problem is pretty much the exact same problem as above. The difference with this problem is, is it looks like it's harder because it said we've got ions now, and it looks like it's harder because you have to write out the chemical formula. But it works almost the exact same way. So what does that mean? So we start out with our 2.4 grams of our K2S. I'll put that over one. Now to figure out the molar mass of our potassium fluoride, we're gonna remember we have two potassiums and we've got one sulfide. So we have to go to our periodic table. And when you do that, you're gonna see that your potassium is going to be um, 39.10 grams per mole for one of them, and your sulfur is going to be 32.06 grams per mole. Now specifically, these are the atomic masses. These are not ionic masses. The things we're working with are potassium ion and sulfide ion. Remember how small an electron is compared to the protons and neutrons? Losing one or two electrons is not going to appreciably change the mass of our ions from what the mass of their atoms are, their neutral atoms. So the number that we see on the periodic table is totally legit to be able to use for our individual ions. So scrolling up here just a little bit, or actually we won't even bother scrolling up here just a little bit. We're gonna go ahead and say that our 39.10 times two plus our 32.06, and that's gonna give us our formula mass, our molar mass of our potassium sulfide to be 110.26 grams per mole. Now I'm not going to round that number because I want to go ahead and just use all the numbers I can from the periodic table. This I'm just going this number this this molar mass I'm just going to be using as a conversion factor. So for the sake of argument for this course please don't round that number to figure out this next bit. The way that we write out this next bit is to take that molar mass that we just calculated grams of K2S for every one mole of K2S. And now we are in moles of potassium sulfide. 
Okay, but the question, if we go back to it, was wanting to know how many potassium atoms are there. And just to prove that that was really the question, we'll scroll to it and we're gonna go way past it. Good. The joys of doing it live on air. Yep, how many moles? Oh, we're not even going to atoms. We're just gonna go to moles of potassium ions. So this makes it even easier. And you say you're a crazy person to me and I say it's not that bad, I promise. The trick here is gonna be this relationship that we wrote out right here. We said that based on the chemical formula, there's two potassium ions for every one sulfide ion. So anytime then we have one potassium sulfide, it's gonna be made up of two potassiums and one sulfide here. We can just use that as another equivalency. For every one mole of potassium sulfide, we're going to have two moles of potassium ions. This is where that donut shop thing comes into play. Yes, their masses have changed, but now using now that we're talking about moles, we're not talking anymore about specific masses. We're just counting how many versus how many. And for every one potassium sulfide here, it's got two potassiums in it. So for every one of these, we've got two potassiums. It's kind of like thinking for every one sandwich you've got, you've got two pieces of bread. So we are now in the units that we need for this problem. So we can go ahead and we can cancel out our potassium sulfide and we're gonna be left with the units that we want. We type it into our calculator, the 2.4 times one times two divided by one divided by 110.2 two six divided by one and we end up with a nice little answer of 0 0.4353 and change we had two sig figs so our final answer will be 0 0.444 moles did I get this to me? I don't think I wrote in all the zeros. Yeah, I'm missing a zero. Er, er, it's going to be 0 0.00435. That's wrong right there. This is correct. And this would be moles of potassium. But... We've got to use our sig figs. I put too many zeros in there again. Good Lord. There we go. So there's our answer, but really we should write that out in scientific notation. 4.4 .4 times 10 to the one, two, times 10 to the negative two moles potassium. And that's a really small number, but when you think about what a mole really is, you could convert that number of moles into ions, individual particles, um, and you would have a really huge number because that's truly how many atoms we have there. Okay, so that's a lot of practice problems and this is a longer video for it. Uh, please let me know if uh, you need more practice problems, etc. But that is the soup to nuts on uh, formula units, uh, the mole and molar mass. 
thank you very much for watching. And uh, like I said, please let me know if you have any questions about this or any other thing regarding class. Thanks.